Welcome to This Organized Life. If you're a mom, wife, or coffee lover seeking advice on how to reduce clutter and reclaim time, look no further than your host, Lori Palau, founder of Simply Be Organized and author of Hot Mess, A Practical Guide to Getting Organized. For a lot of people, clutter is their dirty little secret, but it doesn't have to be. Each week, we will share practical tips, chat with experts, and provide strategies on how to keep you organized. I hope that by sharing our stories, you feel a little less alone and more empowered to tackle the areas that are holding you back. So let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of This Organized Life. I'm your host, Lori Palau. And if you were here last week, then you know that we are going to be having part two of my conversation with Dr. Sharon Celine. Now, if you weren't here, I want you to hit pause, go back and listen to that first episode. Um, Dr. Celine is a clinical psychologist and an expert in the areas of ADHD and neurodiversity. And we know that this is a really big topic Um, that we talk a lot about here and how it impacts people in their lives overall, but specifically when it comes to clutter and organization. And so last week, uh, Dr. Selene and I had this great conversation about um, procrastination and how that shows up. And we really kind of laid some groundwork about diagnosis and, and tools and strategies. But today I wanted to dive into an area that we touched on Um, at the top of the episode, which was all about executive function, what it is and how that plays into our lives when it comes to clutter and organization. So without further ado, let me just welcome Dr. Celine back to the show and we can have this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm very excited to be back for part two and looking forward to chatting with you because it's yes. so easy just to go back and forth. It's I great. know, I know. It's so great. Um, and obviously I know that there's so much information. ADHD is just this onion of layers that we can keep peeling back. And I know it can be both emotional and overwhelming for people. And especially if you are either a struggling with ADHD or you love somebody who is struggling with ADHD. And so my goal with this whole, uh, you know, with these whole series, whenever I talk about them is to kind of break it down into chunks. So we can just look at specific areas and just say, okay, let's look at this layer. And the one area that I want to focus in on today is executive function. So I'm going to kind of just turn it over to you to just, just kind of set the stage for that and talk about why this is such a, a, a critical area when it comes to ADHD and organization. So, you know, we talked last time about what is executive functioning. And so executive functioning skills um, really are are, um, the domain of our prefrontal cortex, which is behind your forehead if you put your hand up there. And it's like the command center of the brain. And it connects and it integrates and prioritizes executive cognitive functions, excuse me, moment by moment. And if we think about it, you know, like, um, let's say the, I'm going to date myself here, but let's say like you two is in the studio recording a new album, right? And so in the studio or at Bono and Edge and, you know, the, the, there's also like Beyond, they've invited Beyonce to join them. And so there are all the musicians who are in the studio. And in the sound booth are the engineers. And there's an engineer for Bono and his voice and an instrument. And there's an engineer for the edge and the instrument he plays and the drums. Everybody has multiple sound engineers. And these sound engineers are our executive functioning skills. And they work together to take the sound, the noise from the studio and make music. And that's what our executive functioning skills do. They work together to, um, it, to uh, it's like a band, uh, the con- they're conductors of a, a, ba- a band for thoughts, feelings, and actions. Um, and the thing that I think is important is that we all have executive functioning strengths and challenges. But for people with ADHD, uh, those challenges can be more significant and more severe and more impairing to various parts of daily life. 
Um, and the one thing I do want to say, which I said in the last episode, just a reminder that the more severe someone's executive functioning challenges are, the higher the likelihood there is of a learning disability. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the best way to get that diagnosis is to have an actual evaluation by a right. clinician. And that evaluation will include, you know, a thorough history taking. It will include rating scales. Sometimes it's a psychological evaluation that includes cognitive testing and, and a visual spatial processing and things like that. So, you know, it's a complicated process. And I think that um, a lot of people today feel like I, I, I see a lot of people, you know, I saw this on TikTok or I saw this on YouTube. I know I have ADHD. Um and, and, you know, or I think I might have, it, it's, it, you know, you, you might have it and you very well might. And the question is then, you know, how do you seek some answers about that? And we talked about that in the last episode, so I won't repeat that. So if you do struggle, like, let's go on the assumption. We know that somebody's struggling. They have a diagnosis. We know that they're struggling with, with some executive function. What are some specific strategies and tools that people can use? Now, I know academically, it's great. I know in, in our situation, we, you know, we partnered with her case managers and teachers to kind of work and, and she had extra support, whether it was co-taught learning classes and things like that. But what about people at home? You know, it's a sh we have a show, which is a big umbrella, but it's a show about clutter and organization. And we want to talk about those good organizing skills to live an organized life. Part of that is picking up your clothes and toys and knowing how to open mail and manage that, like all of those like life skills. So what if someone's struggling with executive function, what are some things that they can do to, some guardrails to put into place to help so, them where their deficit right. is? So there are 11 different executive functioning skills. Um, and depending who you ask, um, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. Um, but, you know, if we think about impulse and emotional control, when people lose it, you know, the thing that we really want to think about is um, how to slow things down. Because what, what there, it's like, people activate very quickly. And so we want to predict and plan for things that trigger them, um, take a pause in the action, identify so what, what soothers are. And I call this um, stop, think, act, recover, the STAR method. And so, um, you know, we want to we want to notice what's happening physiologically when we're becoming dysregulated and then call a pause and have a plan for what to do in that pause. Teenagers might want to go to their room and, and listen to music or whatever. And seven-year-olds might want you to read them a story. So it, it you, but you have a plan of some activities, some families, uh, one family I worked with, uh, you know, created a calm me down box uh, for their kids. They went to the dollar store and bought things for them to use. So, um, you take you take a stop, then you think you come back together and you, you basically say, you know, um, you can't you kind of can, can go over what happened or you can say, you know, what do you think we can do to move forward? And then act is doing that. And R is, of course, taking time to recover and not actually teaching anything until you're away from the situation by a couple hours at least. So. That's the first thing. Now, does that affect organization? Sure, because people don't want to do something. They're going to lose it and they're going to be angry and they'll argue with you. So we want to have a plan. That's the most important thing I'd want people to walk away from the session with is what is your strategic plan and what is your non-cooperation agreement going to be? Because you need a non-cooperation agreement. Um, so if we think about um, organization, uh, what we really want to think about is that organizing, time management, and prioritizing all work together, okay? And so not feeling what time is makes it makes it harder to organize something because you feel like it's going to take forever. So people with ADHD live with a now, not now brain, and it's hard to estimate time because you may not feel it. So using a time timer can be very helpful. I don't own no stock in this company, so it's just <laughs> a useful thing. Um, how do we teach what five minutes looks like? How do we teach what 
30 minutes looks like? What is, what is backwards design? I have to be at camp. I have to, we have to be in the car at eight 30 for you to get to be at camp at nine. So what are the things we have to do? We have to eat breakfast. Okay. How long does that take? That usually takes about 10, 15 minutes. So that's 15 minutes. So now we're at eight 15. You have to get dressed and brush your teeth. That's another 15 minutes um, because there's the wrangling around that. So that's eight o'clock. Do you see? So we work our way backwards until we figure, oh, we got to wake up at seven o'clock or seven. I, I literally just did this with Logan. I kid you not. But and she's a young adult. And we just had this conversation because she's yeah. been going to the gym with me this summer. And we were talking about she's been, she doesn't like feeling rushed in the morning, but yet she's always rushed in the morning. And I said, let's reverse engineer. We need to leave at eight. We want to have, and we want to have time for you to have some relaxation point in the morning. You want to have this. So we reverse engineer to figure out what time she needed to wake up. Exactly. And she had exactly. to work through that because otherwise she was too rushed. She couldn't, she couldn't figure it out. And don't, and, you know, I think one of the things that happens with parents who, who actually have good time management skills is they, this makes no sense to them. Like, what are you talking about? And so, we, you know, the things that parent people who understand time and feel time do naturally that I'm snapping my fingers, like, boom, it comes to you really quickly. It's the opposite of that. Okay. Because you can't allocate time if you don't understand what time is, what, how, what time is, or how long something theoretically takes, which is why you want to figure out how to measure something. Oh, that's going to take forever. Okay. Well, let's just do five minutes. We'll set five minutes of pick up everything from the floor kind of a thing. Right. So that's the, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, one of the things that helps people with ADHD, whether they're five, whether they're 25 or 55, is knowing that things live in a particular space. Where do things live? And the, the easier that is, the better it is, the better off everyone will be. So recently I was staying at my friend's house. Um, they have a second home and um, I was trying to figure out where the uh, air conditioner control was because it was very hot last week. And um, he's like, oh, it's in the basket, you know, from, you know, when you walk in the door on the right, you know, where you put your keys and stuff. And I thought, there you go. Like, that's, that's his coping strategy. He comes in, he puts his keys and his phone in the basket. He knows where they are at all times, plugs his phone in, never has to think about it. And I thought, that's the kind of thing that, People who don't have ADHD just do naturally and people who have ADHD need to learn how to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, so where do things live? My keys live here. My wallet, li my keys and my wallet live here. My phone lives in my back pocket. Um, so um, this means we want to talk with people, uh, with talk with our kids. And I call this a self-smart system of organization. Like what makes sense to their brain? For example, um, you may want to order your spices by the frequency that you use them. I, Sharon, like to order my spices alphabetically because I can't, I can't, I can't find them otherwise. That works for my brain. Your system works for your brain. Neither is better than the other. And one of the things that happens a lot when we're parenting our kids is that we think our way is the best way. And so we want them to do it our, our way rather than actually slowing down and asking them what makes sense, color, order by color, order by alphabetical, order by number, order by whatever, who knows, right? So, um, and we want to give them extra time to organize things because organizing is hard. You have to sort through. And when you sort through something, you have to prioritize, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to get to prioritizing later. Let's go back to systems that make sense. So for example, I worked with a family where a girl wanted to organize, her girl and the, the mother were constantly arguing about the state of her room because in the morning after she got dressed, all the clothes were on the floor. And so we came into therapy on one of these days and the mom was like, I've had it. I'm done. I can't stand this anymore. And the daughter was like, well, you won't let me do my closet the way I want to. 
And I said, that's interesting. And the father was there. Uh, and I said, well, what's the way that you want to do your closet? She's like, well, I want all my purple clothes together. I want all my green clothes together. I want all my red clothes together. And the mom's like, no, that's not how you do a closet. You do a closet like tops go here, bottoms go here, dresses go here. And I, of course, because when you go to therapy with me, I just have to say, like, be prepared to be pushed <laughs> because that's what I do. So I said to the mom, why? Like, why do you have to do things like that? Like, why do they have to go on the road? Because that's what everyone does. And literally, I said to her, well, like, I don't think Queer Eye for the Straight Guy is coming to your house anytime soon. And she's like, ha ha, Sharon, that's not funny. I'm like, oh, yes, it is. And um, so what happened is, so, you know, I said, well, what would it look like to reorganize the room? And then, you know, if like, if not all the red things could go in the closet, that you have a drawer of red things. And um, because the little girl is very clear, she's like, when I wake up in the morning, if I'm feeling purple, I want to wear my purple stuff. Uh, listen, I, I think this kid's making perfect sense. Okay, I don't know about you, but my shirts, like the black ones are here, the white yeah. ones are here, the blue ones are here, because if I feel like blue, I need to find my blue ones. I don't want to go through the whole thing, right? And, um, but that again, works for my brain. Mm -hmm. Someone else's brain might want to have all the long sleeve shirts together, all the short sleeve shirts together, all the sleeveless shirts together. Again, totally fine. Who cares? So in this instance, the father, who also had ADHD, agreed to work with the daughter to redo everything. And it took, like, it was a big project. The kid was psyched. They had a snack. They went out for lunch. They came back. They did the whole thing in a day, and on Saturday, a rain, as a rainy Saturday. And they came back into therapy um, two weeks later, and the kid is like, Slip, skipping into my office and the father is smiling and the mother's like, hey. So I said, well, what's going on? She's, and the, the daughter's like, it's great. It's working. And uh, the father said, yeah, not as much yelling. And the mom said, well, it's like 75% better. You were right. And so that's great. You know, we'll take that. Um, and, you know, separately, I met with the parents and I said, what was hard about that for you? And what was hard was that she wanted to teach her daughter how to organize a closet in the way that she, makes sense to her brain rather than what made sense to really taking the time to figure out what would work for her child's brain. And this happens all the time in couples, all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's the, most of the, the biggest questions that I get from people is about how to air quote, fix my partner. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. But I, I love it. And if for people to, that listen to episode, the first episode that we did together, and you talked about having that motivation and this little girl was excited about doing this because she was, she felt empowered to do it in a way that was going to make sense to her. So she was more inclined to follow through on it which again, we talked about in the last episode, the connection points between the procrastination and all of that, it all ties in together. Exactly. And the thing is, she was motivated because she didn't want to, A, have these arguments with her mother. B, she wanted to find her clothes more easily. And C, she was being treated as a, a maturing child. You know, development is in a child's favor. Kids want to be independent. So we want to use that er that desire for independence in the things that we do. So we talked a little bit before about prioritizing. So most people with ADHD, whether they're kids or they're adults, can do a brain dump of things that they have to do but it's hard to order them because everything seems equally important, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is where we get into the Eisenhower matrix, okay? So what's urgent and what's important? And what's urgent and important are crises. Urgency is a time-related concept, right? You need to do it now because of X, Y, and Z. Um, importance is a value. Right. So when so ideally we want to live in the quadrant where things are important, but they're not urgent. I go to the dentist, even though it's ridiculous. I make my appointment for 
not six months from now, who knows what I'm doing? I don't know because I can't change it once I do. And I make another one I, six months after that. I hope I can go to them. But, you know, then I don't have to think about when I'm going to go to the dentist because I already did it. Right. So that's the kind that you're in the flow. And one of the challenges for people with ADHD is, you know, for example, if they are, they have a lot of stuff, right? They have stuff in their, let's say, kitchen. Um, one of my clients, uh, actually, I'll use a client example. They had a box and that's where they kept their mail. And they really had trouble sorting their mail because they hated it. And so the box was like overly full, but they loved going to Staples. So um, we got, I sent, I sent her to Staples and I'm like, I want you to get some like files that are different colors um, or like a, a file and a file holder so that you can put um, different files. So then she did, she was very excited. She, she brought the box and the bo the folders to our session. And she's like, well, okay, how do, what do I do now? And I said, okay, so we're gonna make different piles. Keep, throw away, maybe. And that's what we did with the whole thing. And then we went back. What, what are, what, what, you know, bills, we identified bills, we identified um, magazines, we identified, you know, cards or letters from people, you know, really breaking it down. And, you know, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, because I'm sure oh. you do this all the time. <laughs> but um, what happened is then she had a system. So for a lot of people with ADHD, it's very difficult to create a system. Because it's they're overwhelmed. The prioritizing is where things fall apart. I can't decide what's most important. I can't separate what to keep and what to save. You know, Marie Kondo did us all a big favor when she said two years. You haven't used it in two years. Mm, you can get rid of it. I think that's a little small on the window. Like, how about four years? I haven't worn it. Or three years. Because, um, you know, two years ago it was COVID. So who knows what people want <laughs> That's so funny. But yes, you are I literally, I was writing down as you were speaking, you empowered and taught your client in this example, you gave her the tools, the system, the strategy. And I think that's the, that's the piece that so many people are missing. And that's the value that, you know, if you don't have that intuitively, if you struggle with executive function, if you don't have that system, getting surrounding yourself with people who can help you work and create that system. So then she can rinse and repeat. So now the next time she gets her mail, if she decides that I'm going to go through it ideally once a day, but even she lets it go to once a week or God mm -hmm. forbid, once a month, she ah. can then, right. I'm listen, I'm a once a day person. I don't even like to bring it in the house. Many but people I work with are not once a day people. I mean, I've worked with people who have you know, over 10,000 emails. Well, I mean, we're, we're not even going there today, Sharon. We're not even going there. That's a whole other episode. But when this, when this box gets filled again, your client can then hopefully sit there and go, I have my three piles and now I need to do it. So, so I guess my goal or my, my, not my goal, but my question here is, once these, once someone who struggles with executive function has these tools, are they then able, like, are they destined for disorganization or is there hope for them down the road? You can expect that it takes about three months to change a habit mm -hmm. and sustaining the motivation to do this on a regular basis is difficult because remember, consistent inconsistency is the hallmark of ADHD. So how, what is their accountability system? Yeah. What is the accountability system? Who are they going to touch base with you? Um, I have clients who basically avoid telling me things because they don't want to be accountable. Oh, I'm sure a thousand percent. And then, and then finally, you know, the, you know, it's things are out of control or they've failed and then they have to, then they have to tell me, you know? Yeah. Like, oh Yeah. So, so, so we want to really um, make sure that 
there's a, a, a system to follow through and without shame because I, there's no shame that's attached, but they're shaming themselves. They are shaming and blaming themselves for not doing a better job. And that's it. And I know we're, we're, we're going to be, we have to wrap this up from, from time, but that's exactly it. So my goal here for everyone listening with this whole series, and I mean, obviously all of our episodes, but specifically with this is there's so much shame and negative self-talk that people with ADHD struggle with both internally and externally. And there are tools. You just have to go, you have to practice a little bit harder. I always tell my daughter, you know what? Some people are born naturally athletic and other people have to practice more. This is just something that you have to practice more and put these guardrails. But thanks to people like Dr. Celine who are out there that can pave that way and give you resources. So on that note, well, hold on a second. I want to oh. take, I want to take the extra time. I have the extra time. So you I do? To, okay. I didn't want to, I, I want to be I do. mindful. So I want to take the extra time because we, I, I want to do uh, some takeaways for building executive functions. Oh, perfect. Skills, I okay? just wanted to be mindful. So, no, no. It. So first of all, um, we want to communicate to people with ADHD. If you're an adult and you're listening, this is for you. This is the, or to kids that having scaffolding in place is not about making excuses. It's about facilitating learning and making adjustments for the natural executive functioning challenges people have because they have ADHD. There are things that you can do that are within your reach that you've got, you have a routine, you're in good shape with that. And then there are things that you get sometimes and you don't get sometimes. Those are 50-50. And there are things that are like, a big reach, you're on your tippy toes, right? So the things that you have, you know, that's part of who you are. You you don't you were you don't have to get, leave yourself notes for those because you've got that, you know. But it's that middle ground of the 50-50. And and that's where the scaffolding has to take place. And so, you know, if you need to set an you know, three alarms on your phone so that um once a week you go through your mail, um, great. You know, and if you maybe need to have a phone call with your sister while you're doing it, um, fantastic, you know, or your coach or your therapist, like use the resources that you have and don't, you know, should on yourself because you you are not able to do this on your own. Basically, this is your Achilles heel. OK, so you need support. This means do more of what works and focus on one area of organization for improvement one thing because you're not going to you're not going to organize your whole house what's one thing that's really bothering you for one of my clients it was their kid would take off their socks and leave them anywhere around the house so we came up with a we came up with a plan it was a clean sweep and every night for 5 or 10 minutes after dinner everyone picked up their stuff around the house and put it where it needed to go in his case it was the hamper um there was also you know books and notebooks that went in the backpack for the next day at school or you know um, your clean bathing suit for, for camp the next day or whatever it is. Um, and to remember that even though people with ADHD are like, I hate calendars. A lot of kids with ADHD, I hate calendars. I don't have routines. Don't tell me what to do. Actually, routines are really important because they foster the executive functioning skills kids really need. And it, they, they teach cause and effect learning. I do this thing and the result is that. So predictability is comforting. You don't want it all the time. You don't want it everywhere. But you want to know that you wake up in the morning, you put your clothes on, you brush your teeth, then you come downstairs as a family and you have breakfast and you pack up your bag and you leave. That's just one rando example. Um, so we want to create routines that you can keep track of if you're a parent, that you can keep track of if you're an adult with ADHD, and that your kids can adapt to. So make a list. Put it on the refrigerator. Don't have 17 things on it. Maximum three to five. That's what people can do. I love it. I love it. Um, was there more? Or was that yeah, it? I wanted to say something about shame. Oh. Just wanted oh. to take a few minutes. So let's take five minutes and talk about shame. Go for it. So, um, you know, guilt says 
I'm a good person, but I did something I regret. Shame says I'm not a good, I'm a bad person and I did something I regret. And what we see with a lot of people with ADHD is there's a lot of shaming that goes on because they probably grew up in a blaming environment or um, they um, they don't believe that they have the skills they need to accomplish something. They expect a negative outcome. Um, and this is just super sad. And what happens is that people talk to themselves inside their heads in a way that they would never talk to anybody in person, right? So if you wouldn't say what you say to yourself to a friend or to a third grader with a skin knee, then please, please consider going to therapy or working with someone, a coach, to help you change your perspective on how you organize or how you approach yourself in the world. Um, uh, shame is uh, really, um, I guess the word I want to say is toxic, very toxic for our abilities to develop a sense of competency, to, to feel like people believe in us and we believe in ourselves and to think that we can learn and grow, right? So we want to um, really work, you know, I know you do this, Laura, you did, did to, uh, Laura, to, to work with your clients on what they can change instead of what they can't. And to that mistakes are learning opportunities. They're not personal flaws or failures. Um, one of my clients says, hopefully this works. If, it, if not, I'll find a new way to do it. Um, sometimes it gets hard, but there's always a way to pick yourself up. And I love that because she was 12. Oh, gosh. I love that. Isn't I, that so great? That really, that really is. And I, I see it. I see the negative self-talk a lot. I see the shame a lot. Yeah. Um, and especially with people who are my adult clients who went maybe oh. undiagnosed and for are so now, long. Yeah. So, and they're again in a, trying to juggle a household and a career and all of the things and don't have the tools in their toolbox and are just so embarrassed and without, and there's no judgment. And that's why I love bringing people like you on our show and why we have our show in the first place is because we want to give a portal for people to know that they're not alone. There are resources out there. There are tools and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And even though you may always have to work a little bit harder, it doesn't mean that you are destined to live in disorganization, crisis, whatever for eternity. Yeah. Right. And, you know, our vulnerabilities, our, our quote unquote weaknesses are actually our areas for improvement. They're, they're not our personal failures. And so one of the things that's so important and that I love about the uh, Simply Be Organized is that it's a strength-based program. You know, we're going to lean into what you can do, what you know, what works for you. And we're going to expand that. And by the way, I'm going to give you some tools and some tweaks to do it a little bit more effectively. So I, I think that's really an important thing for us to leave our listeners with is that, um, you know, good for you for, for, for wanting to figure out what organization means to you and how to live it. That's fantastic. I love it. I listen. I mean, I could talk to you for hours, but I think this is a perfect segue for you. Again, I know you said it on our last episode, but say it louder for the people in the back. Where's the best place for people to connect up with you, learn more, get all your resources? Thank you. Uh, it's www.drsharonceline.com. I write a biweekly blog. Um, <clears throat> I don't share my list with anyone and I won't hassle you with all kinds of stuff. And please check me out on social media uh, at Dr. Sharon Celine. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Facebook. 
um, YouTube. Um, so, uh, you know, follow me, please, and uh, join my community. I'd love to have you. Uh, I also am starting, I forgot to say this last time, but I'm starting uh, in the beginning of August, a live YouTube um, session for Attitude Magazine. Um, oh, that's this will exciting. be um, like just questions and answers, kind of like what we're doing now. So um, check it out. It'll be the first, it'll be the first Wednesday in August uh, at 4 p.m. and every Wednesday after that. I love it. I love it. Okay. We, I know we're on a time crunch. I have to ask you though, because we ask our guests all of this and I didn't do it last okay. time because I knew we were doing a two-parter Okay, because we're all about authenticity here. Yes. We know you obviously are very organized in so many areas, but there's probably an area of your life that you might be struggling. So in this particular season, where do you feel the most organized and where do you feel like a little bit of a hot mess? Hmm. Uh, in in this particular season, which is summer, um, I feel the most organized around my house uh, because I am um, um, I, I don't have as many like layers of clothes, so it's easier for me to put them away and keep my room tidy. And I feel least organized right now and writing my book because it, it is kind of like Mount Everest and I, I'm the person who has to break it down. And, um, you know, sometimes I just get a little waylaid. Like I just want a lot of open time to do what I need to do. And I don't always have that. So I get a little, um, frustrated time management is always my challenge because yeah, there's a lot I want to do and can't do it all. And it go time goes by so fast. I think we can, I think so many of us can relate to that, but thank you for that. And we can't wait for you to read, to finish that book so we can all read it and then have you back on the show to talk about it. Oh, so, please. I'll have, I'm happy to come back before then. That's well, fine. Thank you so much. Again, I really hope that you guys found value out of this show. If you did, please share it with your friends, because I know that there are people out there struggling that need to hear this information. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Celine. And for all of you out there, we'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I'm Lori Palau. Peace out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, please spread the love and share it with your friends. And if this is your first time joining us, make sure to click the subscribe button wherever you are listening so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please leave us a review so other people know that our show is worth the listen. You can also find us on YouTube and Instagram at This Organized Life Podcast. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can head on over to our website at simply the letter B, like boy, organized.com, which is filled with tons of resources, including free downloads, checklists, links to our amazing organizing partners, and all of our digital offerings. I'll see you next week for another episode of This Organized Life.